My name is Vic Amos. I've been fishing for 45 years, anywhere from Oregon to uh, Queen Charlotte Island. So inshore, offshore, prawn fishery. I've done a lot of different fisheries in my lifetime. So. Uh, yeah, Terry, <coughs> Terry Amos. Um, fisherman for many years too, 30 years or more as an owner operator. Uh, grew up in it and um, traveled the whole coast, also the BC coast, some offshore into uh, Oregon and Washington too. Okay, what's important to me in the in the fishery is is that we maintain a family-based fishery where I do with my kids and my grandkids, my granddaughters and my grandsons, my daughters, and uh, that we, uh, and it's not always about making money. It's, it's also about, you know, having fun. You know, you make it fun for them. Um, when, when I grew up as a kid, what I fell in love with was when the weather was bad, my father would go in and they would all barbecue a fish on the beach, you know, and we'd stay there till, till the sun went down, you know. So and then we just we just sit around the fire having just hearing stories and stuff. So, so that's what's important to me is having that lifestyle, and it's not all about making money. It's 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 about about the uh, ability to to play together too. Um, okay. Yeah, the lifestyle is. Uh... It's been some good, good times fishing with the family. Um, yeah, I just hope to have enough uh, you know, openings or quotas to keep going to keep us all active. And yeah, uh, we like this this type of a fishery, and you know, we want to teach our kids well. Yeah, for me, it's it's the ability to survive. You know, you pass on the skill of surviving, the the ability to adapt quickly and change with uh, conditions. You know, whether it's fishery policies or weather or you know, whatever the natural things like El Ninos or you know, um, so you the the ability to um, like fishing can get really complicated. You don't only have to be able to navigate, right? And navigate without equipment. You have to you have to know exactly where you are and where you're going, you know, without all of the modern day equipment. And modern day equipment is nice. So so yeah, so you want to teach them uh, how to survive and 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 and, and and become good at fishing, you know. It it isn't just going out and catching fish. There's there's a lot to it, you know. You have to know how to um, you have to know how to maintain your boat. And a lot of people don't know how to do that. They don't know how to manage money. You have to learn how to manage your money. Uh, because if you don't manage your money, there's gonna be nothing to do any work on the boat with. And so. So that's sort of what I want to leave with my kids is uh, is the ability to um, to identify all of those skills, you know, from weather, navigating, maintaining gear, maintaining the boat, and and knowing where and how to fish the tides, the moons, you know, what what's the best time to go out? Don't go out on a full moon, you know, a few days after the full moon. The uh, the tides are the biggest, you know. They're the they're the largest tides, you know. And uh, so you try to go out when the tides are a little smaller, and uh, you know, especially if you're not so bad in the shallow water, but you start getting into that deeper water, you really need. Yeah, the tides are stronger in the deeper water. Undertows are stronger, so so you really have to know know a lot about tides and weather and uh, 
you know, and, and what's nice now that I see is the, the modern technology, the cell phone, I can pull it up and, uh, and I don't have to rely on just Environment Canada. I can actually look, I don't know where this website comes from, but it's pretty accurate, you know, with the technology of today, satellites and whatnot. Eh? So, uh, so you, yeah, there's a lot to teach kids eh? and uh, patience, you know, to teach them how to be patient, how to work together. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I could go on all day long about that, but yeah, that's sort of the basic. Uh, and I think that uh, if they learn the family values, plus the skills, I think that they're, um, they're they could go to any job, right? And, and that's what's happened with all of my kids. My kids, you know, have all gone on to, uh, to, to, to do well. You know, whether my oldest daughter is a teacher, uh, my other daughter works in construction, she, she does really well at it. She's got a brilliant mind for, um, for numbers, see? Uh, my son Tom is in the Navy in, in Halifax and he's, he'll retire there, you know? So, and my son Will runs a boat, my son James, they all learned how to work. So when they, whether they're fishing or they're not fishing, they take that same skill into whatever they're doing. It's, it's, it, it's that skill of learning how to fish is transferable into whatever field. My kids have all gone into different fields. So I think it's important to teach kids to know how to work, you know, what it takes to be a good worker because if you're a good worker, you'll always have work. You'll always have a job. So, going back a ways uh, with my my grandpa, um, he we didn't have the updated uh, weather programs we have now. So he would he would always be looking up at the skies and the horizons, and he'd be able to read them pretty well actually. What was forthcoming. So uh, and yeah, that and spots he would line up certain mountains and be like a gun, gun sight a landmark and, and he'd tell me of them and I'd I tried program them I, I didn't get them all the time but later later it dawned on me yeah he's, he's got a lot of skill there to find these little uh, details up on how they they got to the spots so yeah peaks of mountains you know peaks of mountains and then you know, line up another mountain below and you know, it's got a, or a point, you know, or some kind of a landmark. And so, yeah, that's what, uh, that's how they all navigated without equipment. <laughs> yeah, long and, before computers, and GPS. And, and my, my dad, they, they, they're going into the harbor. There used to be a whistle boy, navigation whistle boy. It could be green or white or red, but... Anyway, it didn't matter where he was going to. And then what they have is they, they, have, a, they have a whistle. They all have a whistle. So they go, you can hear the whistle, right? And uh, so what he would do when he, like, if he's fishing in a fog, I mean, you don't know where you're going. You really don't. You're, 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 you're really going in by the, you know, just by, uh, you got to run into the shoreline somewhere, see? Once he ran into the shoreline, he recognized the shoreline, so then he would just go along, and then when he got closer, he would shut the engine off, and he would listen. He would listen for the whistle, right? And the whistle was an indicator that uh, the entrance was real close. So uh, so he hear the whistle, and then he would get he realize what direction it was, right? Really important to know that direction. So he went in that direction. And then when he got closer again, he shut it off in here. He's getting closer, he's going the right way, right? So then, uh, then once he got by the whistle, he was probably half a mile from the beach. And from there, he would just, he knew roughly the angle. And again, it was, you had to watch because you had to be so aware as you're going in because, um, the uh, you know the, some of these entrances are narrow, right? And that's why they have these whistle boys outside, so that you you have the opportunity to to hear it and and see it. And 
and they all have numbers. Every one, no matter what color it is, those whistle boys, whether it's white, red, or green, or black, they all have numbers on them. And you can take those numbers and you can put it on the chart and say what, what, you know, what number is that one. You can find it so it all correlates with uh, what, uh, what's in real life and what's on the chart. So that way you know that's the right boy. What I would like to say is that, uh, is that for me, a lot of times people hear I'm a fisherman, eh? and they'll say, good luck to you. You know, and, and I always want to respond by saying, it's not about luck. You know, you, once you've been doing it this long, you go to the same spot, roughly within the same time of the year, and you're going to have them there, or you know that their run is coming by there, right? So, or you know that when it comes to halibut, you know that that that's ideal halibut grounds, right? What, what, what is ideal halibut grounds? The most ideal halibut grounds is a clay bank. Because then you can leave your gear out 24 hours a day uh, without worrying about your bait being eaten up. Now, if you laid it over gravel, which they like sand and gravel, they, you know, you will get lights coming through and eats up your bait and you've got to get your fish out every day. So, I mean, it's important to know those, uh, you know, the, because we, we've had bad days. You know, I've had days of one, two, you know, but I've had days where I absolutely load it, right? They, they come, right? And, and uh, but it's a matter of, uh, it isn't a matter of lucky. It's a matter of knowing where to go, you know. You will have those days where, where everything just lines up and it falls into place. And then there's days where you don't. But in the long run, you, uh, you know, you know so much about where to go that uh, it really isn't about luck as much as the skill to do it, so, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh uh, yeah, for me, I think um, uh, starting out in the morning, we'll get our gear out, and everything will be quiet. And then you're watching and listening. Your your crew is out in the back watching. This is on trolling, and it's uh, you're just kind of waiting there because you know something's going to happen. They're going to bite sooner or later, and then all of a sudden your bell starts ringing, boom, boom, boom. Another one starts to hit, and then it just spikes your uh, excitement, your adrenaline. And uh, yeah, it kickstarts the, the day, and, and it's, it's just a really uh, exciting feeling. Yeah, that's... And you know what I also like is that because things are more, we got more technology, with more technology, technology you have more electrical, and uh, if you have any electrical leaks, even in the minor little electrical leak, it affects your readings. Eh? Like for years, Terry would beat us a few fish every day, and I'm going, well, we got the same gear, we've got everything's the same, right? We're running over the same grounds. Eh? But I think that what we did last year was we. Uh, we did some rewiring, but the boat was 38 years old now, so we took some of the older wire out and replaced it. And, uh, and I, I think that made a difference this year, was, uh, was just, you know, it, it could, I mean, a lot of these older wire, they, they would crack. And, and I mean, they're not completely exposed, but the electricity gets out, right? And it, it can affect your boat to and uh, how it fishes. See. So it's really important to pay attention because you're trying to assimilate, assimilate your boat as a school of herring or school of bait, no matter whatever that is. See. And and that school of bait is like a room here with people. It emanates electrical charge, a positive charge. Right, so uh, so you have to really pay attention to the condition 
of your electrical, right? That's what I'm saying. It isn't so much luck. It's about paying attention to the details, right? And um, because uh, you could have one leak on an electrical pump with a bilge pump in, in, in the hatch where it's always wet. And if that's leaking in there, it doesn't always pump out electricity, but once the water comes up and it pumps it out, it might pump it out for a minute. When the water comes up, level comes up and the automatic pumps kick on, then you have this, all of a sudden you got this charge going out, right? And, and, and if you have a negative field, right, it also chases fish away. If you got too much of a charge, it's no good either. Right? So it's so you really have to get that balance of uh, electrical, and and usually around half a volt to seven tenths of a volt, right? Not quite a full volt, maybe half of a volt right? on your hull. You're just emanating that as you're going through the through the water. So yeah, there's lots to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it's important for my kids, if they're, any of them are going to do it, for them to always have options. You know, like if you have one fishery and that fishery collapses for whatever reason, whether it's in El Nino or, you know, poor runs or bad weather, you know, that you, you really need to have options so that, and I think that's what I said the other day, I was saying the reason I survived was because I have options, right? I had options and, uh, and some of those options meant work. You know, you work really hard. Like uh, for years, I, I, I did a half a million pounds of dogfish. Well, nobody wanted to do it because you only get paid 25 to 30 cents a pound for it. But, you know, when you put in half a million pounds, you at least pay your bills. Okay? So options, so that when you know when the salmon were poor, we could maybe go to the fishing offshore, right? And uh, in years, I've done prawns, I've done link cod, you know, gang troll link cod. I've uh, I've done gill netting. You know, I've done I've done the halibut fishery, all of the troll fisheries. Uh, for all of the species, you know, whether it was pinks or sockeye or coal or, or chinook. Okay, so, so you have to have options in your basket of opportunities. If you're going to make it, you can't rely on just one fishery. And that's sort of what we're getting down to right now. We're, we're going to have to start planning now so that we, you know, if we're going to stay in the industry, we have to survive and how are we going to do that? Because we can't rely on the political process to save us. It's going to be, what are we going to do that's going to preserve our ability to stay in the industry? So, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just getting back to those options, that's really important because um, you never know when you're going to get cut back on one fishery or the other. Like right now, we're doing halibut and salmon, which we've, we've did for a number of years and it's, it's been working out, but now we, we get a cut back of one fishery and we'll, we'll have to, um, you know, think this over before the season now, it's getting there and, uh, decide on, uh, you know, what our, what our next step is. Yeah. Maybe it will be lingcod fishery. Bring up for that if need be and, uh, possibly tuna fishery. So, yeah, we're going to have to um, do something to make up for the shortfall in, in one fishery that's been uh, been put on us this year. So, yeah. yeah, you have to maintain your boat and equipment really well so that when opportunities come, your boat is going to work. One of the problems that I see is that a lot of boats are undercapitalized for maintenance. And uh, so they get all excited about an opening and they'll go up to the opening. And, you know, there might be 30 boats starting out in, in a fishery, but because they, because they don't have enough money for maintenance and they didn't maintain their boats, that uh, 
they, uh, you know, within a day or two, you're down to maybe 15 boats. You're down to 10 boats, you know what I mean? So it, it's really important to, to be on top of your maintenance when you're, when you're down, right? For you have an opportunity to, to, to work on your boat, you work on your boat, right? It's like doing homework, you know, so. What ways to pass on my knowledge of the fishery is, is, uh, is by taking my kids out when they're really young, like, you know, three, four, five years old, they come out. And, you know, and we, um, you know, we always joke that you start out as a cabin boy or a cabin girl doing dishes and cleaning and, you know, keeping the, the cabin clean. And eventually they, they work their way out to the deck and start to pull gear and, you know, make gear. And, and you know, and eventually they, uh, you know, they eventually take things over. And in my case, with my son, Will, he, he came with me when he was 14. And he, uh, he was able to run the boat on his own by the time he was 18. And he ran on a solo trip without me when he was 18. So he's been at it now for probably 14 years. So, uh, so that's, what, uh, that's how I pass it on. You know, and I'm with him as a mentor all the way through, you know, from beginning to end, you know, and, uh, you know, I, 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 fishing can get complicated because there's a, there's an accounting and bookkeeping side of it, which I've never handed over to, to any of my kids yet, but eventually they'll have to take all of that over, and so, um, and so I think that just being a mentor, being there day in and day out and, you know, encouraging them to get started now because, you know, we know the time frames, we know what needs to be done. So, um, yeah, I think it's more important to be a mentor, which, uh, which means it's, you're, you're there all the time. You're never just there to teach them. You're there to work them through all of that. Eh? And you just slowly teach them, slowly teach them to the point where eventually they just take over. Uh, I'm pretty fortunate I got trained by, um, to me, two, two of the top top fishermen in my eyes, which is my dad and my uncle. So I, I got a lot of knowledge. And um, if my son wants to step into the industry, I'll, I'll pass on whatever I can to him. So far, he, he's young and he's not quite sure what he's going to do yet, so, but uh, we'll see how that unfolds.